Great, so uh, I'd like to introduce uh, uh, Professor Dr. Mirko Imlau. Did I say that well? Close enough. Uh, so he's the head of the ultra-fast physics research group at the University of Osnabrück. Um, and he's going to talk about uh, using Lego bricks uh, to allow young researchers to perform professional experiments to follow their ideas. So welcome to the stage here, uh, Dr. Mirko Imlau. Thank you very much for that introduction. And it's true, I'm usually not talking to an uh, audience uh, working in the field of hard and software, open source hardware. I'm usually talking to, to students. And um, the key issue of this talk, and uh, the goal of our uh, project, uh, is to um, get a sustained enthusiasm uh, of young researchers uh, for the field of photonics in order to have uh, in 10 years, let us say, students in my lab that are already, already well educated in this field. So how do we want to do this uh, from the conceptual point of view? Uh, of course, the best is to do this by learning by doing. At the age of, let us say, 7 to 10 years old kids. And uh, for them, we need to have uh, three core components. And one is, of course, you need to have a platform for experiments with photonics and optics, which are low cost and which are available. Uh, second, you need to have uh, setups uh, which are interesting. So the kids are doing wanting to, to build these setups. And um, it would be very nice if they are in line with the physics curriculum. So they are just um, combined uh, by uh, the program that teachers usually do in the class of, let us say, high school and secondary school. So if we put this together, the third component with open hardware, which means that all the kids have open access to all what we need to build up that, which means that you have construction manuals, you have uh, part lists to do this, you have uh, support, they can exchange their ideas, we have games in there and so on via the web, uh, World Wide Web, then we have a very nice concept. If you think in that direction, and we did this a long time, you need to take, uh, you need to consider uh, several uh, things uh, for pupils in particular. First of all, they do not have much money, which means that um, approximately 50 euro can be assumed that pupils are willing to put into an optics and photonics project. Uh, second, if you think about teachers, then the budget of the schools is about 1,500 euro per year. That's not much. Uh, you need to have a high functionality of the system. You need to have a low con time consumption, so it, it should be fast in the build-up time. Uh, it should be somehow cool, yes, just like the robotics of, of Lego. Uh, if, they, if they want to, to build something like that, they want to show it to friends, and this means that you have a factor of copying by that, and so on. So we decided to start the, this uh, project by a com combination of Lego bricks, which are well distributed, together with manuals on the one side, to build up optomechanics, and to combine these op optomechanics with optics which are um, available from low-cost companies. Usually these are astrophysics shops like Astromedia. And this is just the approach we have chosen. If you have such an idea, you need to ask yourself always, are we the first ones who had this idea to combine Lego and optics to give it to pupils? And in these days, all of you know, uh, if you have an idea, then most probably you're not the first, and that's the same here. So it started already in 1997, uh, where people started to play with optics. And you see here there was more the playing in the, in the uh, front chair of their doing. And then uh, they even ended up with a Nature Photonics article which showed that there was a really large interest in 2009, so it's something like five years ago, and uh, a lot of stuff was published, uh, like tables with interferometer, even they have produced bricks which are luminescent by themselves, so just by 3D printer. so everything was cool and everything was just the idea that we had. So the question now is, uh, if this already has been um, shown, 
15 years ago, why didn't we hear about it at all? So what, what did they do wrong? Or is something in the concept wrong? So this is what they did wrong. First of all, if you look into the papers, you find out that they glued Lego bricks. They destroyed the Lego bricks. They cut at them. They drilled Lego bricks just to build up these opto mechanics they wanted to. Then they added parts which came not from Lego, but also they were not commercially available. So they were done in the electronic or mechanical garage of a, of a university. Construction manuals were not prepared, they were not published, the functionality was not proven, and the pupils were not involved. So concerning the first three parts here, so these glued, destroyed, and drilled, who of you has kids? Okay, so what do you think your kid is looking like when you will glue or break your Lego brick? Yes, it, it won't be fun, yeah? So we decided not to go that way. We decided to make it better. And uh, the, the result is our project, My Photonics. Uh, so we, we took original Lego bricks only, uh, optics from commercial available stores. We had, uh, have a very high demonstration of functionality and function. We have construction manual part lists. We have videos of the construction and adjustment. We have a feedback with the pupils and teachers and everything is published as open source on that web page. So I would just go through uh, these points, which are uh, something like a table of content here now. So the example that I have uh, chosen here and that we are showing you uh, outside in the hall is the Michelson interferometer built from Lego bricks. Uh, the Michelson interferometer has some particular advantages because it's something like a historic optical experiment. Initially, it was uh, developed to demonstrate uh, the existence of ether in our world. Well, this was a negative experiment, but uh, still, uh, you can do uh, a lot of things with that. You, so you can uh, show uh, the interference uh, uh, properties of light. You can show coherency with that uh, and a lot of other things. Also, there is only uh, the necessity for a low number of components, which makes it cheap and simple by itself. And we wanted to uh, check the adjustment of the components with the system and also the mechanical stability because usually you need to have something like lambda over 20. So if you have 600 nanometer light, then it's something like 30 nanometer stability. This is how it looks like or it looked like, I must say, in the, in the first stage. We have a, a laser which is just reflected into a beam splitter. Here the beam is splitted into two passes. One is going, sorry, one is going in this direction, one in that direction. The mirrors do reflect the, the light collinearly back into the splitter. The light beams are combined again, and then you have on the screen the possibility to see the fringe pattern. And in the dark zones of the fringe pattern, you have just destructive interference and in the bright pattern you have the constructive interference so the difference here 30 nanometer or 25 this is green light particular uh, it was very important to build um, a mirror mount which has a, the same functionality as the professional ones and usually you have something like a two axis adjustment mount for one inch optics you have a reflection suppression which means you have a black holder uh, you have a height adjustment uh, and the fixing of the adjustment. So this is a direct comparison to a, a mirror mount that was uh, uh, obtained from Newport Company. And you see here that we have the two axes with uh, well, some nice values. But the, the key issues here are that you have a sensitivity of adjustment of about one degree in both systems and here six degrees and one degree in the other, and this is the second axis, which is uh, always worse as if you touch this axis and you always detune the other one. We use as mirrors uh, these Astromedia uh, dielectrically coated mirrors, so they have a high reflectivity, like 98.5%, which is nearly the same as the commercially available ones. So the other parts are quite simple in comparison because for the beam splitter, you simply need to have something to, to fix a plate. The lens is simple and also 
uh, the laser mount is simple. Uh, these are components which are developed quite quickly. Now let us do the function test. This is a functionality test. The measure to uh, get an impression on the stability and on the function of the Michelson deformator is not only that you do see the fringes. Now, the second one is the fringe stability. So uh, the a historic measure is the so-called visibility, which is just, let us say, something like the contrast between bright and the dark zones. And then you can measure with a silicon pin diet the intensity as a function of time. And you see here that uh, the maximum of the intensity does change, so there is some mechanical drift in the system. And if you um, analyze these data, then you find that you have about 500 nanometer per hour. So it means 0.5 millimeters, uh, micrometers per hour is the drift of this interferometer. And you can then compare these values as a function of time with professional values. We did this and you see that all these uh, professional adjustments are uh, in the same order of magnitude as uh, the LEGO interferometer, which means that you do reach on the long term the same stability as if you would build and choose it with professional equipment. Let's have a look at the cost table. Costs are very important nowadays. Yes, everything must be cheap, as cheap as possible. And here we end up with a total value of uh, the LEGO interferometer of 142 euro compared to the professional interferometer of 2,870 euro, which is a factor of 20 between. Let me mention that the biggest part of these costs are related to the LEGO bricks, which means that LEGO is very expensive. The optomechanics and even the laser here that we, we used is was 15 euro, quite inexpensive, quite cheap. How to do construction manuals, That's, uh, that was a really um, big task for us, um, as we didn't want to design a new software for us to do that. But uh, LEGO uh, has published uh, a free available software, which is called the LEGO Digital Designer, where you can uh, prepare these construction manuals. So our mirror mount here, this is a, a snapshot of the, of the software, is then um, developed in these sheets, which allowed us to really print a really construction manuals. Uh, also, you get the part lists, uh, so you need three times that part here with a part number, so you can enter the brick shop of Lego and immediately buy that. You have the cost list with it. However, the software is not an open source software. Well, um, uh, this is a great disadvantage because uh, the uh, software has uh, some uh, really big um, mistakes in there. You, 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 uh, if, if you uh, develop one of these uh, construction manuals, then you will find that uh, one piece must be put into uh, uh, the construction, which is not possible at all from the mechanical point of view. So it's not a really logic software. And uh, uh, therefore, uh, you need to um, uh, work a little bit on the, on the output. Well, my students are doing a big job to, to realize that. Okay, if we have now all this information, like uh, we, we know that the function work, we have the manuals, we have cost lists, and uh, we can put it. We need to put it as on the web page as open hardware. This is our web page. We are also on Facebook, on Twitter. We have uh, links directly to a YouTube channel where we are uh, showing the um, well, construction in real time, sometimes in condensed time, um, because uh, let us say the breadboard here uh, take something like two hours, but you can find the movie there where it's shown in five minutes. It's very, very funny. You should have a look on this. Uh, there are also the part lists on there with the prices, so you do know exactly what you do, the construction manuals. And then you can download this and can send emails to us or uh, make new proposals. We have, from the beginning, included pupils and teachers to this project. This was a very important issue because whatever you do in development, you need to, to look for the, for the target group. And uh, here we, we had an active discussion with teachers, and uh, they, they um, really um, underlined that the understandable of our construction is a very high value. 
that you have this variety of experiments, that you have high qualities. And after this presentation, we had 45 requests of physics teachers of Germany in one week. That's, it. That's usually nothing that you can reach if you're a professor at the university. With the pupils, we have uh, seen that there is a high motivation and a coolness factor. So we reached exactly what we wanted to. The, that they are coming to our labs. They want to play with that. Um, and it's very fast with 10 minutes. And uh, we, we had already requests uh, that they want to write their uh, thesis they, they need to do uh, in this school. This is the uh, first thesis that was done with the Michelson interferometer. Uh, so it's an instrument to uh, prove the existence of ether. <laughs> so the historical approach. Uh, well, she failed, yes, okay. Um, uh, this is a setup uh, that she used and, uh, well, uh, she has added and included here a linear stage in one of the mirror where she could uh, change the beam pass and uh, she was able to determine the index of air well, with that high precision, okay. Uh, she determined the light velocity, uh, and she was able to determine the wavelengths of the laser that she used. So these are all experiments that she, 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 should, should, she could do and perform, and even um, put it into a, a context of uh, physics and physical, physical history. Okay, so this project works. Uh, what can we do else? Uh, you will see outside also an optical breadboard because it turns out that the standard plate that is um, available from, from Lego uh, is very flexible, so it's soft and you lose mechanical stability. So we decided to build up a, uh, an optical breadboard in the same manner as you can buy that from a company like Uport and you know, or those of you who are working with that know that this is built from a honeycomb structure. Uh, we did do the same, uh, and we have opened also the breadboard outside. You can have a look in there. There is exactly this honeycomb structure in there, which serves on one side as a factor of stability for the system, lower weight of the base plate, and at the same time you have some damping. And uh, those of you who really are familiar with the Michelson interferometer, they will recognize that on the table next to the interferometer, there's a vacuum pump running. And although it is running, you do see a stable fringe pattern on the, on the screen. Unfortunately, this is going to be very expensive. Uh, 575 euro is exactly the same price as you can buy it from Thor Labs. Okay, yes, but it's more cool. Yeah? It's a low weight. Um, but, uh, and also you have uh, a thousand bricks that you need uh, and a construction time of about uh, two uh, uh, and a half euro. But with this, you are able to build uh, many fancy other experiments. This is just uh, an an, an, a, a small portion of, of our portfolio. So we have an optical tweezer, which means we can um, trap nanoparticles in a light beam in a microscope. Outside, you do see the microscope that is used for that purpose. Uh, and there are nanoparticles in there, so they have some silicon oxide nanoparticles. They, they can be seen through the microscope. And then you can move these this particles and you can write letters and so on. This is how it usually looks like. In our setup, it looks like this, so it's a little bit smaller. Um, and uh, it's, it's very simple because you only have a CCD, a lens, and a microscope objective here. So people can also understand how the microscope works as they can construct and deconstruct this. And this is the image how it looks usually like. Very important was also the development of motorized linear stages. So which means that we have here, for example, a table which is lifting up the Z component. So it's a, a longitudinal component in a microscope. And we get here a resolution of below two microns. And combined with the, with the optical resolution of 1.7 microns of the optical microscope, now you are able to trap even these particles in three dimensions. And this is something that you can use for, in biology, for example, for uh, the, the um, uh, analysis of uh, particle movements in cells, yeah? which means that also for biology, uh, this, this becomes a very important and cheap aspect in uh, school. The optical tweezer requires then a three-axis uh, position in the system, and this is uh, how it is actually built. Um, the, the key issues here are the uh, motors and uh, the uh, controller from Mindstorm, uh, which is uh, usually um, 
used to build up the, the robotic systems. Uh, now it becomes a little bit more expensive, yeah, such a Mindstorm brick, which is usually nothing else than an Android, uh, an, 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 uh, an electronic board. Uh, you, uh, you pay something like 200 euro, yes, in this direction. And then, well, you, you, can, you can move something like a, a target to uh, or a nanoparticle to a target by just movement of the table of the sample with respect to the microscope and so on. And all this works with uh, Lego simple things. But Lego, uh, turns out, is uh, only one possibility to realize that. There are, uh, for some specific things, other um, uh, toys available. For example, if you think about Fischer Technik, which is a, a German uh, company, uh, you have uh, a better uh, uh, portfolio of gearing components. You have uh, larger brakes and you get a higher mechanical stability. So, for example, for the building of, of, the, um, of the optical breadboard, we think that it's much better to use uh, Fischer Technik. But it doesn't mean that you use only Lego or only Fischer Technik. There are a lot of other uh, platforms, and they can be uh, combined uh, in meanwhile by the 3D printer and technology. These free universal construction kits are already published online, so you just can uh, copy them to your printer, print it out, and then you can combine Fischer Technik with Lego and so on. So there's a, there's a huge playground to continue this uh, project. So optics and photonics with Lego bricks uh, has uh, shown to be ideally suited for the promotion of young researchers. Um, we have a variety of optical experiment, and the significance for our success compared to the uh, other groups is definitely that we have used the original Lego bricks. We have uh, realized the feedback with students and teachers from the beginning, and we have developed all the components, the optical mechanical components, at a very high level, which is, well, possible because of our professional work. And we combined that with construction manuals, part lists, and videos, so it means that we had really an excellent approach, but this was nearly the same as others. But we combined it now with open source hardware, and this combination is just uh, what is the um, story of success here. And thereby, this sheet here is now not acting as a table of content, now it acts as a summary, um, that we have this combination of uh, original bricks, commercial available optics, functionality, construction manuals, the videos, feedback, and open source, which makes uh, us also believe that uh, the story of, of these um, setups will continue um, in the next years. So with this, I would like to uh, thank you for your attention and for giving me the opportunity to present it here, also to Sebastian, who did a great job here in organizing uh, this meeting. Thank you. We have um, some time for questions, if there are any questions for Dr. Mao. I have actually two questions in one regarding the mechanical drift. Uh, first of all, is it known where it comes from? And second, is that measurement with or without the breadboard? Uh, the second question I must address to Monsieur, was it with or without a breadboard? Without the breadboard already, yes. And the first one was uh, the, the origin of the drift. Um, drift you, you have in any um, interferometer usually, and the mechanical drift is usually due to, or the, the, the main, the, uh, the key component is uh, the temperature. Uh, because of temperature, you have uh, uh, extension of your parts, and uh, you need to know that uh, this plastic has a, a higher, uh, larger extension coefficient than metal. And uh, so if the temperature in the laboratory changes as a function of time, and this is usually what happens from night to day, we have something like 23 in the, in the day and in the, the night 80, the and then, the well, and then, then the, 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 you have a shift, and you see as a function of time, if you measure for a weekend, that the, in the fringe pattern moves out and then it moves uh, together again. So there's something like a breathing of the fringe pattern. We have analyzed this in detail, but the key issue for us was to analyze this in comparison to the professional interferometer. Yes. Okay, thank you for this question. This is Any other questions? I'm not biting. 
I guess that's it. Thank you so much for that talk. Uh, it's very inspiring. I hope other people are inspired to do things for education because uh, our world needs it. <laughs>